Uh, okay, so <clears throat> next we'll hear from Bruce Gellin, who's the president of the Global Immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Uh, he oversees Sabin's mission to make vaccines more accessible, enable innovation, and expand immunization across the globe. Before joining the Sabin Institute, uh, Dr. Gellin served in the US Department of Health and Human Services as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health, and he was the Director of the National Vaccine Program Office. He's got a broad public health experience and has also worked closely with the WHO in their uh, GAP program facilitating capacity building for <coughs> vaccines production in uh, other countries. Thanks, Bruce. Check. Thank you, and thanks to the forum for allowing the band to come back together. We've been at different places at different times, but we've been through this discussion at the beginning of it, during it, and now in a, in a reflection on it. Uh, and I'm here mostly in my capacity, capacity to talk about what it was like at the time in 2009, although I think it's worth thinking through about when Rick Bright at the beginning showed that model from Bill Gates, it, the, the theme here is about time matters, time to the first dose, and importantly, we often get time to the last dose, and that, that speaks to the overall global capacity of the need for, for broad vaccination, not just to have vaccine, not just to have vaccine in front of the curve. So this little cartoon makes it look simple: vaccine, vaccination. Poof, it happens. Uh, it's not quite that way. So the the WHO um, put together a deployment initiative, and this is a report on the initiative. And I put it there mostly to take so you can at least look at some of the components, because as you've heard from Karen, from a regulatory perspective, and from Wenqing, from a surveillance perspective, those are big themes, but the details matter. So just a few things, if you can squint and read about uh, the issue about donations, the importance of keeping track of ancillary products, that there's a financial support that has to be, along, belongs, be a part of this. There's importance about bilateral support, legal agreements um, by the donors and the recipients. Steve will talk about the pre-qualification process at WHO, not just the, not just what, not only what Karen talked about, but sort of how the vaccines move for the, through the system and how countries need to be able to be prepared to accept them and, and acknowledge that they are suitable for their populations. The, the part of this deployment was identifying the countries that would be eligible to receive. They had to say that they wanted to and to demonstrate that. From a donor's perspective and for those with vaccines, both the companies and governments, it was, it was critical to know that a vaccine was going to be deployed somewhere that wasn't going to be sitting on a dock because it was a global shortage and you could already see that image of that happening somewhere. And so the importance of recognizing that countries had the ability to absorb it, they had a plan for it and a plan for how to use it, including some of the legal issues, was a critically important piece of this. And all of that added to the timing. So it's only to say that there's a lot of texture to this, which sounds simple of, sure, WHO can coordinate deployment, but there's a lot to it, including deciding who gets what vaccine at what time. Um, excellent. So, so you've, see, you've, you've heard this story. You've seen curves like this. This is the U.S. story. The importance here is to look at the, at the timeline at the bottom. So vir the blue is the vaccine. The virus is doing its thing during the summer, and I think in the United States, the first vaccine um, reached, the, reached clinics first week in October of 2009. The United States, October 2009. This is, the, this is from this report. So the timeline here starts on December 2009, and what this is is the blue bars are the deliveries, and then the, 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 the black line is the volume, and you can see it didn't start for quite a while. So it took the ramp-up time was significant. So not only had the virus come and gone in many countries, but, but the vaccination program had already maybe often it was fully underway and maybe completed in some places, um, and took a long time to find its way into the, into, the, into the rest of the world. And then there's the unpredictable. The arrow, the bent arrow, is the volcano in Iceland. Of course, you all remember that. That stopped air traffic, so that had an implication on delivery. There were there were things about the delivery and the, and the delivery that seemed to be every day. And Dennis will remember these. There seemed to be new things invented every day. There was a deployment going somewhere, and all of a sudden, some shipping company said, "Well, where is your certificate of fumigation?" Of course, you know that if you're going to be shipping things on things that contain wood, they have to demonstrate that you're not going to then send some kind of organism along with the wood, and that delays. There were a number of these delays that were, were, were that, that, that 
ended up into the system that delayed some of, the, some of this all the way down to the endpoint. So just put these out there so you have a sense of the number of components that went into this because this was a system that didn't exist beforehand and it was essentially developed on the fly for this, for this deployment. And just the recognition that there were a lot of components to this. We, KG at the beginning talked about some of these elements, the whole, the whole issue of cold chain when you're, when you're supplying this many, this many doses at one time that overwhelmed a number of the systems. Uh, Steve will talk about some of the legal issues. Karen will talk about some of the regulatory issues. And then from the perspective of the donating countries. So the, the uh, pandemic declared in April. Vaccine starts probably the next minute for vaccine preparation doesn't show up until October. During the summer of 2009, there's a broad discussion in the United States and other capitals about those with vaccines, what do you do? And I, I'll just characterize the discussions at the, at the White House as those who are on the domestic, domestic policy versus those who are on international policy. Those on the domestic side are thinking about, well, we don't have enough vaccine for our citizens and we're giving some away. And the global side saying, well, the, the rest of the world uh, doesn't have enough and we have to do something about that. That decision actually went to the president, and it was in September when he decided that we would give away 10% of the vaccines that we had to WHO for that deployment, leaving it to WHO to, to figure out who gets it. Because you can also imagine the politics of country A donating to country X and then not donating to country Y and what that means. So, so WHO took that one on as far as the, the equalizer, if you will. So you can see already that from what we heard about in terms of both the speed and the capacity, it wasn't enough for everyone. The equity issues will be handled on the next panel, so we'll push that off. But just to highlight the, the whole level of complexities of a program that was essentially developed on the fly uh, and was able to ultimately deliver vaccine, for the most part, too late. Um, but at least it was, a, uh, it was an, as an episode in, in trying that. And the question is now, of all the things we learned almost a decade ago as we celebrate so we're running out of anniversaries. This is the end of 20, uh, 2018, so we can't do the 1918 for too much longer. We'll move into the decade after, 20, after 2009, I guess, is the, is the next party we'll come to. So just the, the, the purpose was to lay out the range of complexities. I just gave you the highlights uh, that went into this program that was developed on the fly, for which, getting back to, to Wenxing's point, it also requires global collaboration. The one point I will flag, that, that so my, my comments here are mostly about the vaccination end of this. I think we also should look at the vaccine end. And we think about, uh, as, as Clem talked about, the vaccine, current, currently the, the flu vaccines that we use, that we plan to use for a pandemic are the same, are going to be made in the same places that seasonal vaccines are made, which comes to the element of what, who makes the call on when you switch. Because at some point, the threat is there, and do you stop making next year's seasonal vaccine? and switch over to this future pandemic, not knowing if, in, in, that, in fact, what it's going to look like, but knowing that by making that switch, you're essentially taking away next year's seasonal vaccine supply. To you, Steve. Okay, 